From the Crystal Cathedral in Garden Grove, California, welcome to the Hour of Power with Robert Schuler, America's television church, celebrating our 32nd year as the face and voice of positive Christianity to the world. exciting morning this is going to be. My special guest this morning is actor Kirk Douglas sharing with us his candid story of how he came back from depression after his stroke. It's a story in his autobiography, Stroke of Luck. Isn't that great? That's putting something into the positive. My son Robert is here with us. We welcome back John Tesh one of our favorite friends and visitors here. <laughs> Playing from his new CD, A Deeper Faith. Plus the Lacoming College Tour Choir from Williamsport, Pennsylvania, directed by Dr. Fred M. Thayer. So thank you for coming. Let's pray. Lord, here we are. You put it all together, and we said yes. Your invitation has been accepted. So do what you wanted to do in our lives. We'll be receptive. You won't have an argument from us. We may not understand, but we'll just have faith, smile, and trust you. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 37. Hear these words. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance 
of peace. May God continue to add peace to your lives as you trust in him. My guest this morning is one of the giants of the greatest times of Hollywood, Kirk Douglas. In six decades since he took to the stage and screen, Kirk Douglas has starred in 83 films, nine plays, breaking Hollywood's notorious blacklist in the 1950s. He's written eight books, made a remarkable commitment to humanitarian causes throughout the world known internationally and across generations for playing the indomitable Spartacus. Topping internet, yeah, Spartacus. <laughs> Topping international bestseller lists and building parks and schools in troubled communities. Kirk Douglas is a legend in his own time and serves as an inspiration to us all. And I want to say personally, I've had the pleasure of being close friends with the great men of Hollywood and the women, like John Wayne, Gregory Peck, the list goes on, Bill Holden, but finally, the giant is here, Spartacus himself. <laughs> now in his new book, My Stroke of Luck, isn't that a positive spin in a title? His vivid and very personal reflection upon his extraordinary life, Kirk Douglas shares his story by offering a candid 
and heartfelt memoir of where it all went right, revealing not only the incredible physical and emotional toil of this debilitating stroke, but how it has changed his life for the better. Now, I want to say right now, Kirk Douglas, this is a place that every year gives out Scars into Stars Award. And I want to tell you, I'm going to invite you to be receiving that award later on this year. Would you come back for that? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kirk Douglas, your stroke, how did it happen? Well, first of all, I'm overcome with this cathedral and your wonderful, wonderful introduction. But my stroke came in a funny way because I've had a helicopter crash, almost broke my back. I had to have a pacemaker. Then I had a stroke and I thought, I thought maybe God doesn't like me. <laughs> so I will, my wife insists I might have a manicure because I have peasant hands and she thinks that manicure will help them. So I was having a manicure like a rich movie actor and, <laughs> and suddenly I felt a strange sensation across my cheek. And when I tried to explain, I couldn't talk at all. All I did was babble. And the nurse, uh, the manicurist had been a nurse, and you, she, she knew I was having a stroke. They called my wife. They took to me to, to the hospital, and I couldn't talk. Now, Doctor sure think of it, an actor who can't talk. <laughs> what, can, what does he do? Wait for silent pictures to come back? <laughs> but, but it wasn't very funny at the time. And I tried to deal with it. And finally, I could talk a little, and people seemed to understand what I was saying. Do you understand me? Oh, very well. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. In this book, you tell how you were so depressed to the point of suicide. Now, I'm going to ask you, is this rhetorical, or, or is it literally true that you took a gun and put that gun to your mouth? You know, I'm ashamed to talk about that. I wrote it in my book because a stroke can fill you with such depression, you become suicidal. And I did, and I did put a gun in my mouth. I, I, I said, it's over. And the gun hit my tooth, and I, ow. <laughs> and suddenly, I was saved by the, uh, by a toothache. <laughs> you know, the, when I tell you, Dr. Shooter, I learned that suicide is dumb, and selfish. Because when you are contemplating suicide, you are only thinking of yourself, and you are not thinking of other people. So I'm glad that part is over with. Wow. Wow. Your wife, Anne, married to you for 48 years. What did she do to help you? My wife 
you know, when you have a problem, when you are in a tragedy, you must find solace, maybe God, maybe friends, maybe people around you. And my wife, yes, 48 years, how could she stand me for that long? <laughs> but she was very helpful because she believed in tough love. If I said, oh, oh honey, I think the, tomorrow morning I would like breakfast in bed. She would say, breakfast in bed, sleep in the kitchen. <laughs> so, but she, she would push me. Come on, it's down for you to work with your speech therapist. So she was a big help. And I want to confess something to you. We have been married for 48 years. God willing, on the 50th wedding anniversary, I'm going to propose to her again. And she said, yes, I'm going to marry her again on my 50th anniversary. That's great. You've received many honors, many awards, much recognition. Uh, how did the Lifetime Achievement Award, 1996 Academy Awards, how did that rank? Well, you know, they offered me the Oscar before I had my stroke. But when I had my stroke, I said, well, I can't receive the Oscar. I have never talked to people at that time. And my son, Michael, I said, Michael, you go up except for me. He said, not he, he said, Dad, you have to go if you have to crawl. <laughs> so I said, I will go and I will say, thank you. And I'll practice saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I was ready. And I was backstage at the ceremony, and Stephen Spielberg was saying such wonderful things about me. But suddenly when he said, Mr. Kirk Douglas, I almost fell off of my chair. <laughs> but I went on trying to look like Spartacus. <laughs> and I said, I will say thank you. But there were about two, three thousand people. And they were all standing up and applauding, and, and I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I have to say more than thank you. So I said a few lines more, and that was the first time I, that I spoke to people, and they seemed to understand what, I'm, what, I'm, what I was saying. So that encourages me. That was a really momentous occasion in my life. Fantastic. Fantastic. Now, <clears throat> most people say stroke is just a negative event, but you've turned it into a positive event. And so why did you title the book, My Stroke of Luck? You know, when you you see, I was so self-centered for, for a big part of my life. I would make one movie after the, another, thinking of, always of, of some physical character. And when these things happened to me culminating in my stroke, it made me take some self-inventory. And I learned a lot. I think that my stroke made me a better person. I learned how to deal with depression. You know, 
the depression affects all of us in varying degrees. With a stroke, it's terrible. You want to just curl up in bed, and you don't want to see anybody, you don't want anybody to see you. And while I was in that state, my dog, Banty, hopped off the bed. He would come for me, and he went to the door, and he, he wanted to get out. So I get, got up out of the bed, opened the door, and he wagged his tail, and he left. And I thought, hey, I did something for something else. It made me feel better. So I began to think, when you have a depression, think of other people. Try to help other people. And that, it may not take away your depression, but it will relieve your depression. And so my book, My Stroke of Luck, Maybe a better person. I began to really believe in God. I began to think, yes, you must pray to God. Sometimes the answer is no. But God will help you. And I learned that the shooter, one prayer that I say every day. God how do we find you? How do we know you? You are as close to us as breathing, yet you are farther than the farthermost star. You are as mysterious as the vast solitudes of night, and yet as familiar as the rays of the sun. We try to find you. Amen. And that prayer has helped me. So that's why my book is called My Stroke of Luck, because I realize that anything that happened to you in life could be worse. And here I am. I have been invited to speak to you. So life is not so bad. <laughs> I've never imagined that Spartacus could become so spiritual. <laughs> you are wonderful. I, I want to say to the people here, uh, his, his honesty and his humility stands out beautifully. And you read about his faith in God, page 159. A medieval rabbi once explained prayer with a parable. When we pray, he said, we think we're changing God. Think of a man in a rowboat who's pulling himself to shore. To someone who doesn't know what's going on, it might appear that he's pulling the shore closer to himself. Similarly, when we pray, it may appear that we're trying to pull God closer to us, but we are really pulling ourselves closer to God. Beautiful. Yes. And people are talking about you. They love you, Kirk Douglas. Uh, they respect you, Kirk Douglas. And they are very thankful to you for sharing openly the blossoming, blooming, beautiful faith in God. You've had it since a child. It's gone through phases, does for all of us, but it's never shown more beautifully than in this time, and you've never expressed it more beautifully in this book. And I thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much.
Thank you, Donald Lou, and thank you for Peter O'Farrell. You're the greatest. I will never forget how my brother came home from World War II, where he saw extensive action and was a litter bearer. And he showed me the little Bible that he had. It was made available to them by the Army. And I've never forgotten it. And I'm holding in my hand today a copy of that Bible. It's not exactly the same, but same size, small enough to fit in a shirt pocket, small enough to fit into your purse or your organizer. And what it is, it is the New Testament with the Psalms from the Old Testament. And the New Testament, what we've done, it's a red letter edition, which means all of the words of Jesus are in red. You can take this, and if you really want to know what did Jesus say in his lifetime, and you're curious, it won't take long to read it, really it won't. And on the cover, I have put the Bible verse that is really central, the North Star, to this whole ministry for 50 years. On the cover, you read the Holy Bible, and then you read these words, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40, verse 31. This is my gift to you. There's no charge. I want you to have it. I know there are going to be times when you need encouragement, where you need a spiritual uplift. This is written by God through the people that he inspired to put down these words. Just write to me, Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. Let me send it to you. Naturally, if you can enclose an offering, we need it and we'll be most grateful for it. That's why when you go to a church service, anywhere I suppose in the world, every Sunday there's an offering collected and that's the free will gifts of people who are so thankful for the ministries that they say thank you with a gift to God. So just write to me, Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California and I'll mail you the most powerful little book you could possibly have. Thank you. John, introduce us to your friends. This is on violins, Dr. James Sitterly. The marvelous singer, Christine Miller. Timothy Landers on guitars. Gannon Arnold on guitars. And Randy Seimer on the guitars. Wow. 
I didn't know you could sing. All your other CDs is fabulous, fabulous music. But never have we heard your voice so beautifully. Why, you. why did you make this CD? Um, I just felt it was time to, to do what I do in church. Every Sunday I lead worship at Beth Ariel Fellowship in, uh, in Sherman Oaks, along with a couple of us here. And uh, it's, what, it's, it's where my heart is. You know, my wife said to me, she said, you know, I've never, ever seen you work harder on anything in my life than you do on leading worship for 125 people every Sunday. And it's, it's just, it's a real freeing place to be for me musically. And I've wanted to do a real serious worship album for a long time. And, and I, asked my, I asked my pastor before I came here, I said, how should I describe this record to Dr. Schuler? And he said, just say they're love songs to God. That's Which is what they nice. are. It's really nice. Yeah. It's very nice. And that will lead anyone to a deeper faith. That's the title of yes, it. Yes, sir. Uh, has your faith deepened a deeper faith? Has it deepened over the years? Yeah, I, you know, people are always asking me the born again question. And I, as you know, because we've known each other for gosh, about 11, 12 years, is uh, I grew up in a, in a Methodist church on, on Long Island, and I memorized all the scriptures, but I didn't memorize the feeling of the Holy Spirit because I never really had it in my life. And certainly every day I live in these worship songs, I feel like I'm, I'm getting deeper in, in my faith. And the deeper I get, the more grateful, just like uh, Kirk Douglas said, the more grateful I, I feel of, of, of God's blessings. Wonderful. Got another song for me? We do. Let's do it.
It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made. It's all about you. It's all about you. When it's all about you. It's all about you. When it's all about you. It's all about you. When it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. John Kesh, A Deeper Faith. Fantastic. You can get it in our bookstore or www.ourpower.org. It's a wilderness out there, he, he said to me. And he was trying to describe to me how it was tough being a Christian in today's kind of a world. He said, it's a wilderness out there. It's wild. It's tough. And I said, then you better go back and read the Bible in the Old Testament. <laughs> Because the heroes of the Bible are people who lived in the wilderness. Oh, yes, they did. He said, like who? I said, start with Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses. No, he said Moses was raised in the palace. And I said, but he landed up having to go to the wilderness. Remember the burning bush? And then David, a little boy, he knew the wilderness. Oh, did he ever. And it was probably in the wilderness when he wrote Psalm 91. Those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Was he sitting in the opening of one of the caves in the rocky hills? Did that remind him of living in the quiet, solemn presence of God? Psalm 91, David wrote it. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him I will trust. Wow. Did he do that after he had slain the lion? Read Samuel. I think it's in chapter uh, 17, verse 34. An amazing thing, if you haven't read it. David was a hero. Yes, he slew a leopard, he slew a lion. He lived in the wilderness, and that's where the lions lived. And in Samuel, he says, And I saw the lion with a lamb in its mouth, and the lamb was bleeding and still alive, and I grabbed the beard of the lion and pulled the head back and the lamb was set free. Did you dare to do that? <laughs> he was a hero, young people. He would have won the gold if there had been an Olympics for courage. Absolutely. In fact, you know, can you imagine what he could have earned if he had endorsed the Nike? Wow. It's a wilderness out there. Oh, you bet it is. It's a wilderness in the pursuit of peace. People that are proclaiming they're for peace, 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 and they kill each other. Christians, Jews, Muslims, all say they're people of peace, but all have blood on their hands in their history. It's a wilderness trying to find peace. It's a wilderness out there in the world of religion, you bet. All kinds of religions, all kinds of beliefs, all kinds of superstitions. A person who was raised in the faith, historic faith. Now he's into all kinds of weird astrology. Come on. 
is, it's not astrology I'm fighting, it's the superstition that I'm fighting. It's putting the critical part of your brain aside and just believing in superstition. In the world of religion, take your choice. So, wilderness out there, surely in, in culture today, in music, in sex. Oh, it's a wilderness out there. In the business world, it's a dangerous wilderness. In politics, in entertainment, in sports, yes. What is a wilderness? A wilderness is where almost anything goes if you can get by with it. Wilderness is no boundaries, no fences, no borders. Do what you like. It's dangerous. It's wild. It's wicked. It's a waste. Oh. Even among good people, it's wilderness. When it comes to life's careers and pursuits and goals, you know, the wilderness has no ambition of generating fruit or food. It's a wilderness for many of you are living in a wilderness. I know you are. You, you just don't have any set focus in life. No dreams, no goals, no passionate purpose, no challenging choices. What are you living for? What's the purpose of life? It's a wilderness out there. Oh, then guess what? I read the words of the men of God who lived in the wilderness, Abraham, Isaac, David, and Jesus who spent 40 days in the wilderness to confront Satan. You know, there's a, wilderness is not all bad. In fact, we all need what probably only the wilderness can offer. And what's that? A sense of being alone, facing it, the mystery, all alone, not knowing when we'll die, how it will happen, what our private future is. It's a wilderness. We're alone, even without the wife we love or the husband who's the security, alone. No, wrong, Schuler. You don't need to be alone. What you need is God. And that's why God is set up living in a way that we all have to go through our wildernesses. Because we all need what only a wilderness can offer, and that's challenging choices that are private and personal that I make. Not my wife, not my mother, not my father, not my son, not my daughters, I make it. You have to say that. Choices that you alone make. And you make that choice to be a believer in God. David did that. Then you make that choice to privately pray in your own way and in your own place, you and God. Then you can understand what David is writing. Those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. Yes. Hey, I challenge you to come and live in the wilderness. 
Many of you haven't. You don't dare. You'd rather be in the crowded city. You don't want to be alone and face your life with all of its challenges and choices. We all need what only a wilderness can deliver, and that's personal growth. Where I stand up, stand out, and say, here am I, Lord. Take me. I'm a believer today. Oh. And then the wilderness will not be waste. It will not be wild. It will not be wicked. It will be wonderful, beautiful. So, if the truth is we, we can't escape the wilderness. It's always all around us in one way, probably at work, probably in study, probably in your private moral life. I don't know. But what you need, you need a North Star. You can go through the wilderness, but oh God, don't get lost. You can get lost so easily. You need a North Star. Well, we don't need North Stars in the ships at sea today. Computers, you press the button and it'll tell you exactly where you are. But up until this high-tech age of this century, the dependence was still on the North Star. And everybody learned, you look for the Big Dipper and draw a straight line from the bottom of the cup through the edge of the cup and it'll point you to the North Star. Just find the Big Dipper and it'll point you to the North Star. And what I say to all of you living in the wilderness, is it in politics, business, religion, culture, morality, sports, what is it? Whatever your wilderness, you need a North Star. Well, that, the Bible, is the Big Dipper. It points to the North Star, and that's Jesus Christ our guide and follow him. Had a few days, my wife and I just said, let's call it a vacation. And we just went out. And we went to a movie, a walk to remember. Everybody should go see it. Every high schooler should see it. It's all about the high school kids. And about one girl who was mocked and scorned they called her the Virgin Mary, and they scorned her for it. They landed up giving her flowers. It was even the high school boys <laughs> sit in the movie and they cry. Take your Kleenex along. It's so wonderful without being maudlin or sentimental or unbelievable. It rings true. One girl. And she stood up for what she believed against everybody else in the school. And she landed up receiving flowers from all of them. It's a very beautiful story. A North Star. It's a wilderness out there, and you choose how you're going to live in it. You make the choice. And you could be a, an oasis in the wilderness. You could be a blooming flower in the shade. And then you'll experience strength, security, and serenity. It's today you just make a decision. Just believe. Just believe. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you. You're calling us from the Bible, from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, from David and from Jesus Christ, who said, I am the good shepherd. I give my life for my sheep. Hallelujah.
Amen. Lord bless you and keep you and go with you and give you peace. And you're going out and in your coming in, in your lying down and in your rising up, in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears until you come to stand before Jesus in that day in which there is no sunset and no dawning. Amen. You've just seen the 1,693rd consecutive broadcast of the Hour of Power. On behalf of everyone here at the Crystal Cathedral, thank you for tuning in today. Hello, I'm Ed Arnold, one of over 3,000 volunteers here at the Crystal Cathedral Ministries, and I'm very excited to share with you this wonderful pocket-sized New Testament in Psalms that Dr. Schuler would love to send to you today just for the asking. This handy-sized New Testament in Psalms is the perfect size to tuck into a pocket, briefcase, or purse and carry with you as you travel this summer or when you need a quick bit of motivation during a hectic day. Let these loving and divinely inspired words bring life to your heart as you read the beautiful words of King David as recorded in the Psalms or from the words of Jesus as recorded in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This pocket-sized version of the New Testament in Psalms even has the words of Christ printed in red for easy reference. Today, Dr. Shooter wants to send to you your very own New Testament in Psalms when you simply write to him and ask for it. No gift amount has been specified for this wonderful written treasure, but if you are able, please be sure to enclose a monetary gift to this ministry that we may use to help pay for the television airtime in your community. As many of you know, the Hour of Power began the summer by having to cancel our contracts with many broadcast stations across the United States.